order. Sorry, we're a little bit late. Um, thanks everyone for accommodating a little bit later start for us uh, tonight. And we've got a lot of business to get to. I don't really have um, president's remarks on behalf of the whole board, except to say we're um, very much looking forward to Dr. Kelly's presentation on the New Bronxville Promise language. Um, we're also going to introduce the tenure process tonight, and um, we very much want to, in the theme of our continuous improvement with communications, want to um, make sure that we um, communicate ways to provide feedback during the tenure process. Um, we very much want to encourage that. So uh, with that, why don't we... Um, Move into approval of the minutes from the last regular meeting of September 21st and the special meeting of October 2nd. Do we have a motion to approve those minutes if there are no changes? Motion. motion. And second. second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. And Dr. Kelly? Very good. So I'm going to cede my initial time over to Shay Lewis, our student representative. Given that we are starting this meeting an hour later than usual, I want to give her the opportunity to speak about um, some highlights and then to go do some homework. <laughs> um, yeah, we have a lot of homework. <laughs> annoying, but um, <laughs> we've been very busy for this past month. Um, we had a really successful homecoming, which was a lot more interactive than past years. We The blue-gray day was a lot of fun. A lot of people participated. Not many seniors, but most other grades participated. We had the Battle of the Banners for the sports teams. Um, all the banners are out for the senior class, and it's everyone's included, not just the sports people, which I think is special for a lot of people that don't would not otherwise get a banner. Um, we had a really great pep rally, which I think a lot of the elementary schoolers enjoy, enjoyed a lot. Um, there's a lot of screaming and dancing from them, and I think it was just really good for like an interconnected community. Um, the bonfire was a lot of fun. It was a lot more interactive this year with the photo booth, DJ, bunch of food. It was a lot of fun. And then same with the food truck night was also a lot of fun, and our boys soccer team won, which was just a plus. Um, and then just congratulations to all the sports teams. I know everyone worked really hard, and it was a really fun week. Definitely stressful, but fun. Um, this past week, we also had done a lot, and tomorrow we're doing more for Breast Cancer Awareness Week. We had a pink out just to raise awareness and support, and then we also, our SFL club, sold a bunch of bracelets, pins, and twos. We were having a big sale tomorrow, and potentially doing a walk-a-thon, just all in support of breast cancer and trying to raise money. Um, and then we also have picture day tomorrow for high school, and we've had picture day this past week for elementary school, and I'm pretty sure middle school. Um, so that's also a lot of fun. And then we just have a bunch of sports updates. Um, most teams are already in playoffs or going into playoffs. Um, our girls' tennis team just won section champs, which is really exciting. Um, <laughs> Also, one of my good friends, Victoria, won sections herself, which is also really exciting. And then the girls and boys soccer both won the Bronco Fest tournament. And then the playoffs for soccer start this week. Um, boys is tomorrow, and then girls is next week is our first game. And then football still has like two weeks of regular season until they go into it. But yeah, so just a lot of upcoming games, a lot of schoolwork, seniors are still working on their college stuff, um, and I know that the freshmen have officially established their great government now, so they'll be starting to do some things as well. And we just have a few fun upcoming events. We have our senior Halloween parade, which is on Halloween, um, and then we also have our Halloween parade that the BYC hosts from high school, and that's with elementary school students, and there's a haunted house, and they go trick-or-treating around town. I think it's just a lot of fun, and yeah, it's just been a, a lot of fun activities, but a lot of busy activities. That's pretty much it. Oh, yes, I forgot about that. <laughs> we have seen a lot of um, French exchange students around. So they've been falling around their assigned partners in our classes, and I mean, almost in every single one of my classes, I have one or two. 
And um, I think it's really cool. I've talked to a couple of them. They all speak very English very well. Um, and yeah, and I, it's just a really interesting and unique program, which I think is really cool. Yeah. yeah, it's great to have it up and running again. Yeah, it is. And I think a lot of the French students are also enjoying it. And, fun. and I think like the French people that are coming over, from what I've heard, they find our school very fascinating and different from theirs. So I think it's just interesting to see the differences. Thank you, Thank you, Shay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, good luck tonight. Thank you. So I just wanted to add um, to Shay's that it's been uh, delightful to have these French exchange students with us. We haven't been able to do this since pre-COVID. Um, the school that we have historically partnered with could not continue to partner with us. And through some random connection that we didn't know existed right here in Bronxville, we were able to partner with a new school um, in the countryside, in the south. And, um, and what's uh, very exciting is that they also are conducting some research on one of their local rivers. So it's been um, nice because they're learning all about our Bronx River research. In fact, they were down, um, a cohort of them were down at the river today with our class. So uh, we're, we're so pleased that we're able to welcome them into our community and a, and a thank you to all the families who were willing to uh, take in um, our French exchange students. Uh, our fifth graders right now as we speak are in Philadelphia. Um, and all initial reports indicate that it is going <laughs> exceptionally well. Um, so we'll ride that. Um, they're really all having a great time and it's a wonderful opportunity for the adults also to be able to see the students in a different setting um, outside of school. And then I just wanted to send a special thank you to the PTA for um, hosting an event for all of our new families. Um, that was last week and it was really a wonderful evening um, getting to know our newest community members and really to help ensure that they learn everything they want to learn about us and especially uh, the great work of both our PTA and the school foundation. Um, so it was uh, lovely to be able to welcome them in person. And as Susan alluded to earlier, I wanted to just spend a few minutes um, sort of launching the season of tenure. Um, so one of the most important decisions made by the Board of Education is the decision to award tenure. Um, under current New York State education law, teachers and administrators who complete a probationary period of four years, three years if they've been uh, tenured in New York State prior to being here in Bronxville, uh, they, if they are to continue in employment, they are um, appointed to tenure in their positions. Um, the superintendent of schools makes a recommendation for appointment to tenure, and it's the Board of Education that responds by approving or rejecting those, uh, the superintendent's recommendation. To provide accurate assessment for the recommendations, the principals and other administrators maintain a program of yearly evaluation of our teachers. That includes both announced observations as well as unannounced observations, and then informal walkthroughs throughout the school year. This year, the board will be hearing about tenure candidates in executive session starting as early as this fall. And then tenure candidates will go formally before the board at our April 16th, 2024 meeting. We strive to sustain a positive, trusting relationship among students, teachers, and parents. To that end, we welcome comments and suggestions about our school programs and services from all members of the school community. We want our schools to continue to provide a safe, comfortable environment so that you can raise questions and concerns. So each fall, and now we are at the time this year, we are inviting formal feedback about personnel decisions. 
And while such feedback is only one part of a comprehensive process, we welcome all students and parents to participate. Parents, students, and any other community members may share their perceptions through a signed letter addressed to the principal in the case of a teacher who is up for tenure, or to me, the superintendent, in the case of administrators that are up for tenure. Such letters will be acknowledged in writing by the supervisor and then shared with the individual teacher as well as with the superintendent and the board. I encourage people to write letters early and certainly no later than March 1st. And you will see in this letter that is going out to the full community, there will be a list of probationary teachers and not just those who are eligible for tenure this year, but those who will also be eligible next year and the year after. Um, and again, it's never too early to be providing feedback. And I also encourage you, it, it doesn't have to be in writing. If you're more comfortable just uh, making an appointment uh, with your principal, um, then I encourage you to do so. Because the more information we have, um, the more informed decisions we can make. Any questions from the board on that? No, thank you. Okay. So now we're going to move to um, bringing some closure um, to the process we have been engaged in so seriously, um, really for over a year. And uh, that is our Bronxville promise. And I want to just review the timeline for our Bronxville promise. So for those of you um, who have been around a while, we first created this Bronxville promise in 2014. And then it was in 2017 that we recognized that in order for this to really, the Bronxville promise to really be infused uh, within um, our school, we had to make sure we were creating curriculum and instruction uh, to align with the promise. And that's when we first created our indicators. And then we realized that it was time to review these indicators and outcomes of our Bronxville promise because we needed to decide what language needed to be updated based on how our students' needs have changed or broadened since 2017. And um, the former superintendent, Dr. Roy Montesano, uh, created a superintendent's advisory committee to take a look at this. And as a result of that, we realized we, wanted, we needed to hear more voices, not just those on the committee. And the board decided to hold two workshops with the theme of diversity um, and inclusion to allow any community, community member to speak and to give their opinion about the Bronxville Promise. And we held those two um, workshops this past spring, the spring of 23. And as a result of that, some themes surfaced. And the themes included uh, the need to update our language as it, as it uh, involves evolving technologies, specifically artificial intelligence. We also wanted to make sure that um, it included uh, civil discourse, as well as the theme of belonging. So our faculty spent a tremendous amount of time at the end of June in heterogeneous K through 12 groupings, looking at each disposition of the promise as well as the heart. Then over the summer, as a result of that work, the curriculum leaders, the board, as well as the leadership team reviewed the, the verbiage again. And then just this past fall, a couple of months ago in September, um, I proposed the refined language of the promise that was developed by the faculty, and I made it uh, available to the entire public. And I gave anyone an opportunity who wanted to fill out a, a Google survey to give us feedback on the refined language. And that brings us to this evening. 
Um, we uh, did get a number of um, community members' feedback. Uh, the leadership team, the faculty, and the board uh, looked through that feedback um, without names on it and were able to synthesize it and um, create what I am sharing with you this evening as our final and updated version. And what's up? It is up. Great. And it's all on one page. And it's all on one page. What do you thing. think about that? Thank you, Brad. Ashley, our Director of Technology. Um, so what you see here is the refined language. Um, we had created the heart of the promise again back in 2017 because we realized that there were characteristics we wanted to um, to emphasize that weren't necessarily weaved into the four dispositions of critical thinker, leader, innovator, and engaged citizen. So what you see in the heart is that we added um, compassionate, empathetic, and supportive, which was in leadership, and we put it in the heart. And then we added the fourth indicator in the heart, to, in, to address important qualities of perseverance, self-confidence, and integrity. And then we added the fifth indicator to address a sense of belonging. In Critical Thinker, in the second column, we updated the second indicator to include um, artificial intelligence. And in the fourth indicator, you see we added the reference to civil discourse. Under leader in the third column, both the first and fifth indicator were added to reflect qualities of a leader. Listening, understanding, risk taking, discourse, and being decisive after considering input from others. And then in the third indicator, it had compassion and we had moved compassion to the heart and we rewarded the advocacy for oneself and others. Second to last column, an innovator. In the first indicator, we added creativity because we want students to demonstrate creativity by making something new from what they know. And then we added AI and other evolving technologies to the fourth indicator to be used responsibly and ethically to challenge and expand upon their thinking. And then in engaged citizenship, we had already had respect for diversity, and we wanted to further elabor elaborate upon that language by saying that we want the students to connect, to be able to listen to multiple perspectives by reserving judgment, asking clarifying questions, and understanding someone's experience with empathy. So we feel um, really good about this refined language. Um, it's a task that uh, we've been engaged with uh, now for months. Um, I'm really impressed with the engagement of the faculty throughout the district, our leadership team, the board, and so pleased with the input from so many community members. And. Um, we are already uh, working on curriculum to make sure that it adequately reflects the Bronxville Promise. Thank you so much, Dr. Kelly. We're very grateful for all the work that, um, that went into this on your part, on the faculty and staff and leadership team's part. And we also are so grateful for the engagement of so many community members at our workshops and providing feedback on the draft language that we circulated in September. Um, and we feel that um, we've incorporated this new language into a, you know, a set of aspirations for our students that is very much lived and breathed in the school. Um, so we wanted to mark this occasion um, with the adoption of this new language by expressing a statement that the board agreed on. We, the Board of Education, are grateful to Dr. Kelly, our faculty and staff and leadership team, to our community, 
and our community for the collaborative process which began last year to update and refine the language of our district's Bronxville promise. The updated language adds outcomes related to civil discourse, provides needed guidance with respect to emerging technologies, and incorporates throughout the values of diversity and belonging. Since 2014, our Bronxville Promise has guided curriculum design and served as an expression of our aspirations for our students. Today, we accept with gratitude this 2023 update of the Bronxville Promise. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Thank you. Dr. Ketke, thanks so much. finally talk about uh, how our students achieved during the 22-2023 school year. And I always begin uh, with a shot of the graduating class, last year's graduating class that are all off to college at this point because we will end uh, with the data that indicates where all the fabulous institutions that they are attending. Um, and this is really a special opportunity uh, for me to talk about data. Um, that begins in our third grade and goes through our senior class. Uh, and it's also really an opportunity for me to thank all the teachers who work tire tirelessly and every day to make sure our students are achieving to the best of their ability. So there's always lots to celebrate in this presentation. There are questions we asked ourselves based on this information that will guide us throughout the year as we continue to think about um, curriculum and assessment. So um, before I begin, I just want to talk briefly about, um, I'm going to begin with three through eight ELA data and math data. But let me just start by talking a bit about the ELA test first. Uh, you know, in, in prior board meetings, I have talked about um, phonics, encoding, decoding, things of that nature. And as you know, based on my updates, um, we are paying more attention to phonics education in our kindergarten, first and second grade. Uh, based on our analysis of data in terms of encoding and decoding, our students decode and read quite well. Uh, we were seeing some issues with the spelling, which is why we are paying a little more attention to phonics than we have in the past, and so far seeing good results from that, which we will continue to monitor. But this ELA test, you know, obviously encoding and decoding are necessary skills, but this is really a test of comprehension. Students are asked to identify key ideas and details. Uh, they analyze author's craft. They think about the structure of, of the pieces that they are reading and the integration of knowledge and ideas. So students are exposed to several reading passages um, where they have to read them and answer multiple choice questions which align with comprehension. They also uh, write, so there are short responses, which are called two-credit responses, where they have to comprehend and analyze the text by making an inference and using evidence to back up that inference. And those are very short and concise uh, responses. They also have a four-credit extended response, which is what we would consider an essay. The students are writing from sources, sometimes one, sometimes two, in which they have to compare and contrast. They uh, create a thesis statement and express an opinion and support that opinion with evidence from the text. So that is, that is all encompassing what, is, uh, what the ELA includes. Um, and for example, they might have to explain the central message of the story, explain how characters' actions um, are uh, described and, and move forward by the author, how, they, how the characters' actions support a central message, and they use details from the story to support their answer. So this is you know, sort of a high-level test for students um, that builds on their ability to 
read and write, uh, but it's also very much a comprehension and analysis based test. So what you're looking at here are this year's uh, numbers. So the blue bars represent the percentage of our Bronxville students in every grade, three through eight, that scored proficient, meaning scored at a level three or a level four out of four levels, one, two, three, and four. The green bar, the points at the top, on the top green line, represent the highest performing district in the comparison group indicated below. So that's Bronxville, Byram Hills, Chappaqua, Edgemont, Marinette, Pelham, Rye City, and Scarsdale. And the red line, the dots, the points on the bottom red line, represent the lowest scoring district in that comparison group. So you can just get a context of sort of where we fell with neighboring school districts and school districts with similar demographics. Um, so again, these numbers are quite strong. Uh, we're very happy with them. And if you look, for example, at some of the grades, you know, we do represent the high bar. In fourth grade, we were the highest scoring out of those districts. And in many cases, we were one to two to three percentage points off, which is not significant. Um, I think some of the questions we have for ourselves at this point uh, are how well this curriculum is aligned to next generation learning standards. And in prior presentations when I do this, I often do a lot of comparison data, how different cohorts performed in prior years, how our fourth grade did this year versus how our fourth grade did last year. Um, I'm not doing that because these are the first tests for a new set of standards. They are updates to the Common Core standard. The updates I would not describe as significant, but it is worth now a discussion um, to determine how well aligned our curriculum is with these updated standards. Uh, so that is a conversation we're going to have across all of these grade levels this year. Um, and I will point out that in third grade, uh, those numbers, you know, are not typical. And as you can see, we're probably a little bit more below um, the green line than in other grades. Um, but we have looked at that a bit. And we did notice some instances in the short response uh, when students were asked to give short responses in writing to informational texts. Uh, we saw a little dip there, so we want to look at how much informational text they're exposed to. I will tell you in this test, this version of the test, the essay, the extended response, was eliminated from the third grade test. Um, so the other grades continued to write the essay, but the third grade did not. And to be very honest with you, because of the amount of writing our kids do from the units of study through advancing literacy with TC, they do quite well on the essay. So we wonder also if not having the essay in third grade influenced our numbers somewhat. Um, and the other thing we sort of, you know, joke about every once in a while is in short responses, our students often include additional information, and they are actually scored down for doing so. So that's another thing we are looking at when we think about um, how these results are going to impact what we do with students. I would just like to add that I met with the fourth grade team this morning because those third graders are now fourth graders. We are making sure that all of the students who scored at a level one or a level two um, Many of them already receive support uh, outside of the classroom w through skills and s other support teachers. Um, in, if they do not, uh, we will be sure that the classroom teacher is supporting them. And also, if you did receive a two, a low two, we will be calling those families and offering them support outside of the classroom. Um, with a support teacher and some skills to close those gaps. And we do that across the grades for students who receive a one or two. Many of them are already very well supported, uh, but if a student is showing some um, signs of regressing, we're going to make sure that they get what they need, either in the classroom environment or through a support teacher. Uh, to close those gaps. And we're already looking at this data versus our fall star assessments for those individual kids as well. So we have quite a handle on 
uh, our students here and, and what they're going to need to just be sure that they're going to continue to do well. But again, these numbers, you know, are in the 80s, some as high as 87 and 88 percent proficient. A lot to celebrate here, and those are the questions that we're going to be asking ourselves as we move forward with regards to ELA. If the board has any questions at this time, you can feel free to chime in, and then I'll, I'll move on to math. Okay, let's go to math. Um, so these are the math numbers, and again, just for you know, repetition's sake, the blue bars represent the percentages of our students who are scoring at a level three or four. The green line is the comparison districts who are scoring uh, highest, and the red line is the district scoring lowest. Um, and again, they're not necessarily the same district. So for example, Edgemont could be the green line in third grade and it could be the red line in fourth grade. So it's not consistent within the districts uh, which, which of those they represent. Um, you know, you could see we're doing quite nicely here as well. Uh, again, those similar questions, um, how well are we aligned to the next gen standards? What do we need to do to make sure um, that curriculum is lining up with that uh, and what is being tested um, and so on and so forth. And, you know, we don't, as an example, if you think back to what I mentioned about ELA, our students in third grade do a baby lit essay where they learn in a unit how to write an essay. I still believe we should be doing that even though they don't write an essay for this test. They need to know how to do that for fourth grade and fifth grade and on. So not all of the curriculum gets shifted based on this, but we adjust where we have to. And maybe in that case, we do the baby lit essay after the test. Uh, so we shift what when we do things, but some things are important to do whether or not they're assessed in these three through eight uh, tests. Grade eight, um, I did not put up because it's a very small N. Most of our grade eight students take algebra, so we will talk about them in terms of algebra and not necessarily math eight exams. Any questions about these numbers? Is one, so the kids that, that are score ones and twos that don't get support, do you guys account for, hey, you know, kids just had a bad day? Or they were sick that day and took a test just before? No. Do we, we see that? We don't just call it up to a potential bad day. First of all, I would say by and large, the majority of students who score level one and two are already being supported. Uh, for some students who fell below that line who had not been, they will either be, th those skills will be addressed either through small group instruction um, within the classroom or this, they will be offered support of a support teacher outside of the classroom. Now, if, pri if data that we're getting from them this year starts to show, yeah, that might have been a really bad day, um, that would be okay. But we generally don't, I don't wanna give the impression that we just chalk it up to a bad day here and move on, right? We do do our due diligence with it. And if future data shows that, yes, that might have been just a bad test, um, you know, they're, they're, they come out of those programs once, then that kind of support once they've closed the gaps or we, we have the data that suggests they closed the gaps. Yeah? As far as the curriculum leader, I was very happy to hear you say, you know, you, you're going to stick with things that don't necessarily get assessed Tested. or put on the test. I mean, it's always, I think, the parent's concern or probably an educator's concern that you have so much focus on these tests. But it doesn't mean that the values that we have here should rise above that, particularly at early ages or around those standards that are that are That's so, correct. So I mean, we do, we do want to do well here, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, I you know, our teachers want our students to do well. I want our students to do well. But it doesn't mean we're going to pull away from things we believe are important um, from the curriculum based solely on these numbers. Right. Our academic standards are ours. Correct. And that is our responsibility. Thank Correct. You. What percentage of children take this test now? So in Bronxville, we do not have high opt-outs at all. Some districts suffer under that. We do not. 
Um, so I would say we have a handful of students who opt out. It's, it's not significant enough. And again, you know, these numbers are something to be very proud of overall. We got a lot of test takers. <laughs> um, and the other thing, I, I, two more things before I move on from ELA and math. These reports will be backpacked in the Infinite Campus portal on Friday. So the parents will have the information about how their child did individually. And um, this year, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders took it on the computer. Next year, all students, to include third grade, will take it on the computer, and that is mandated by the state. Last, this year, you can, we could have done grades four through eight. Next year, we have to do three through eight, so we just decided let's just move it along, which may be a reason that they took away the essay from third grade, because it's hard for a third grader to type an essay, um, but we're still going to teach baby lit essay because it's one of my favorite units and it's good for kids <laughs> okay you know I, I do show this slide every year longitudinally as you know 2022 we were number one in the state in both ELA and math it's hard to sustain that um, so we had a slight drop here this is combined grades three through eight percentage of students who are proficient but again, this is quite a story to tell where we've come in the last 10 years. All credit due to teachers who worked very hard on curriculum and every day in their classroom. Do we see 2023 as a, um, is, is there a COVID effect in there in that we saw some learning loss? Um, we lost four point, points, it looks like, in ELA. And I see the net, same thing on the next page on math. I would say this is more about new standards being assessed mm -hmm. at this point. Okay. Because we didn't see it last year. We didn't see it last right. year. Right. right. And, you know, at this point, it is what it is, and we need yeah. to pick it up. Got it. <clears throat> We're at the top in the state, and you said in 2022? Correct. And, and how about in 2023? How do we do? I don't know yet. Okay. I'm sure I will find out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it was the athletic, athletic director who cued us in that we were number one last year. Got it. So, uh, but somebody will tell me. And those are reported. We don't get that information. Those are reported from various media who are taking all the data once it's released and ranking schools. Okay. No. Well, go to the next. Yeah. So this is math longitudinally as well. Same same thing. Any questions about either of those before we move on? Okay. It does help us. It motivates us or uh, to have these conversations with the teachers, right? About these new standards that are coming down, and this is a perfect impetus for that conversation to make sure that we're, uh, we're aligned with the standards and then, and at the same time that they're not holding us back. And these, and these numbers look so good, like, you know, it looks like the, the current fifth grade class is just a really smart class. If you have them drop out from eighth grade to ninth grade, your numbers are thin, like these three, you know, four points. I'm going to show you some better numbers later. Yeah. You know, great numbers are great, and then they also make us very nervous <laughs> because it's it's difficult to sustain. Um, but we have a we have such good um, in, quantitative information here that our students are are doing well, and I think that's what we should focus on. Next slide, please. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about algebra. Now, I will say this was the Regents Algebra given to our eighth graders. This is the last year this test will, next year, the t pardon, this year, the test will be aligned with updated standards. So last spring, it was aligned with 
former standards, and this spring it will be aligned with updated standards. So what happened last year in three through eight math will begin to affect some high school courses um, that New York State provides Regents exams for this year and moving forward out to about 2026. One of the reasons I really love sharing this slide is you may or may not be aware that we had a highly tracked eighth grade algebra program for many years. And the concern about tracking algebra uh, in that way is that it really, it really sets the stage for who can take advanced placement calculus A, B, or B, C. Now there are ways if you, don't, if you didn't take algebra that you could maybe take a summer course and try to get back into that track. But for the majority of students, if you're not taking algebra as an eighth grader, you will not be eligible. It, it never seemed morally right to be making that decision with children that young. So we did make the decision in 2021 and 2022 to open the enrollment. And as you can see, we have anywhere between 90, 94, 100 kids, depending on the size of the cohort, taking algebra. We used to be somewhere in the mid-60s to 70s. And the average, average region score really has not changed. In fact, it went up last year slightly. So this, to me, indicates that open enrollment works and is good for our kids. Now, those kids work very hard, but they do well and they r remain eligible for advanced math going into high school, which I think is fair. Any questions about this? That's great. I mean, it, it, is that decision then usually driven by kids or parents, would you say? In this case, I think it was the administration. No, I mean the yeah. decision on whether you opt into algebra. It is made by parents. So we give yeah. a recommend, our teachers recommend, but the recommendation is non-binding. They can cho choose to follow it or not, right? So a seventh grade teacher might say, yeah, I think they do quite well in algebra, or I don't know, I, maybe ma math eight is the better uh, class for them at this point. But that is just a soft recommendation because either way, if they want to opt into algebra, they are they can do so. Yeah. So it's it's families, it's parents in consultation with yes. their kids and kids rising clearly to the challenge. Yes. Yeah. But you know, we did discuss it as an administrative team where it just felt like there are many districts who have open enrollment for algebra, and, and why can't we? Mm -hmm. OK, next slide, Connie. This is just another way of showing the grade 8 math students, and I think it's worth looking at this, because level 5 is the highest level you can score on this exam. And 86% of them get a level 5. So not only do they do well, they do very well. I just want to talk briefly about science. Uh, science is one of these assessments that we'll be switching over to updated standards. So typically, the science test was given, um, the, the last revision of science standards was 1996. Um, so typically, a test was given in grade 4 and grade 8. Um, they did not give the fourth grade test last year. They did give the eighth grade test last year. As you can see, 92% of our eighth graders were proficient on that exam. This year, the new assessment will be given to students in grade five, which is why grade four didn't take it, because they're going to take it now, and grade eight. So those new assessments will be rolling out in the spring. OK, this is some information about the New York State Regents. Uh, and these are science regents. And the, you can see here percent number of students who get a level 4, a 3, a 2, or a 1. Most of the students do get a level 4. The line and the numbers at the top of each bar represent the number of students that were tested. So you can see how many students we actually give the, these tests to. I think the important point to make here is most of the students in high school are enrolled in advanced placement courses. 
and therefore the sciences that are, they are taking, AP Chem, AP Bio, all, the curriculum is geared towards that, that's the curriculum and those assessments. So it's not uncommon actually for teachers to have to stop and just kind of quickly prep kids for a region's curriculum, which is very different because it's a graduation requirement that a student pass a region's in science, okay? So it isn't the thrux of our curriculum and mostly what we're doing, but I do report on it anyway. And to be honest, there is a conversation to have here. It's not a this year conversation, but it's maybe a future year conversation. If, as what we did with algebra in eighth grade, those students who take the regions have fulfilled that requirement, if we want to move, let's say, earth science as the eighth grade course, the students can take the eighth grade, the, our science regents in eighth grade, and be done with that graduation requirement before moving to high school. Um, the reason we haven't done it yet is because all of these shifting standards and shifting assessment in science, we need a better look at what that might look like. But that is worth having a conversation just so that the AP can, curriculum can continue without having to, you know, deal with this. Um, kind of parallel issue of a regents and a, and a passing of a regents for a graduation requirement by the state of New York. Any questions about this? Okay, Connie. So some of these regents, we actually do give a good number of kids. All of our juniors take the Common Core ELA, uh, and as you can see there, they do very well. 100 out of 118 got a level five. So again, you know, when we talk about reading and writing and a lot of what's been reported in the media, we know our kids read and write well. Um, all the numbers suggest that. Uh, these students who are taking the Common Core Algebra are doing it either as freshmen or potentially sophomores, maybe even freshmen and sophomores. Uh, these two, uh, U.S. and global, are new assessments. Global, this is the second time we gave global, um, and I think we had 58% of students were at a level five uh, in, in the prior year. Now we're at 88. So often what happens when they revise these assessments, you know, you see the standards, we read the standards, but once you see how it's being assessed, then you sort of say, okay, now we see this and we're going to shift again. Um, but you may have heard me talk about enduring issues essays where students have to identify an enduring issue of history, describe it through multiple documents in essay form, make a connection to the current environment and how well or not well um, that enduring issue has been addressed by society over time to include present day. So these are advanced assessments. Uh, and our students in global did quite well. This was the first U.S. history. Um, so now that we kind of get a sense of how they're going to assess this, I'm sure those numbers will improve. But I do want to point out that 7 through 12, our history teachers did an incredible amount of work last spring, this summer, and into the fall doing some vertical alignment. Because you can't just prep for these experiences in 10th and 11th grade. The skills that they need, the historical thinking skills, have to begin as early as sixth and seventh grade. And they did a great amount of work, you know, vertically aligning and getting on the same page when it beca became a conversation about what does a seventh grader need to be doing in order to prepare for what needs to happen in 10th <coughs> and 11th grade. So there is a lot of vertical conversation that goes into that as well. Any questions here? Could you say the same about U.S. history, global, and ELA regents that you said about science in terms of the percentage of students that are in those AP courses and then just taking this regents to meet the graduation requirement? Yeah, I mean, the majority of the juniors who take the regents ELA are taking AP Lang. Right. So they're not in a regions-based course. But at that point, they read and write pretty well. So those numbers aren't necessarily surprising to us. 
And it would also be true that a large majority of the sophomores are taking AP Global and the juniors are taking AP US. So, But I do report on it as as required. Mm -hmm. <laughs> check, check. Next. <laughs> exactly. I do. I make all these slides. OK, so let's talk about AP as an example. Um, so this is, I try to do a five year out. Um, you're looking at the total number of AP students. Uh, so if I'm a student and I take, well, I'm going to reverse. If I, I'm a student and I take three exams, three AP courses, uh, I am can, counted in that number. If Dan's a student and he takes one AP, he's also counted. <laughs> it's just a chance to tease you, um, and I'm going to take it. Um, if he takes only one, he's also in that number. Um, so... I have kids represented there who are taking four or five and kids who are only taking one, right? But that's the number of students that we have and the number of exams. And I do feel it's worth pointing out. I mean, I, I don't think anything is going to change. And we've talked about, you know, um, we've talked about this internally a lot. But I, I feel it's worth pointing out. In... 2019, there were 318 AP students. In 2023, there were three, 308. That's not a very different number, but it's nearly more, 100 more exams. So kids are taking a lot of exams and APs, and they're doing great, and they're under stress, right? So it's just, I think, a point to acknowledge as a community. Um, we're very proud of them for taking these courses and doing so well, and we need to acknowledge that it's a lot. So what you're looking at in the third column is AP students with scores three or better. So out of the 308, 291 of them scored three or better on at least one exam. And then the bottom row is percentage points. So what that is saying <clears throat> is that nearly 95% of our students who are AP students scored threes or better on the exams. So they do quite, quite well here. And if you look longitudinally since 2019, more exams, more students getting three or better. Dr. Kaki, do we have these data by percentage of total tests um, and those who score three or better as well, as opposed to by, by student. So in other words, we have here AP students with a score of three or three or better. They may have taken four tests. Yeah. And they scored a three on one of them or better. I'm trying to get a sense for how do we do on average on all tests. We do have that information. I mean, we usually don't present it um, because there are, you know, teachers tied to these tests. But I could tell you that these numbers don't represent students taking four exams and getting only one three. They do quite well on all of the exams. We get a report of every fourth offer mm -hmm. and every single score right. and the average score in the So we go through those just to see, are there tests where we're not doing as well? Are there students who aren't doing as well? And kind of dig into them, I think, to the level you're referring. OK. And then just maybe to ask that, the teachers also see that and um, examine the, you know, the results from last year, the tests from last year, 
to improve construction and curtain design for I don't think Mickey's asking for the granularity of by subject, but just overall, all of the tests we take. Percentage of students getting threes, fours, and fives? No, just even if you provided like an average score on all of the 822 tests that were we'd taken. We'd have to, I think we'd have to calculate that, right? Because we don't get that, but we could. We'd have to take the individual test reports and average it. The note is that in general students get either one or seniors. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. And and often they um they know whether the test will give them any credit at college at that point. Colleges have been getting giving less and less college credit for AP tests. Mm -hmm. Um so we that's one of the things we struggle with. So we do require seniors to take the AC. So yeah, fair enough. So you know best how to break it down. But you we can, can do that. Show us juniors and seniors separately. We we're not looking to uh, expose any subject areas, so yeah, there's no absolutely. need to to do yeah. that. We can definitely look at it. Right. And I just, don't just looking at it by total number of tests taken. I don't know if everyone knows if you take the course you are required to take the test. So these aren't students who enrolled in APUS and get to the end and decide I want to take it, I don't want to take it, you have to take it. So all the students take these tests. Okay. Given to Anne's point that colleges are taking, not really taking APs anymore, you know, before people tutored up and wanted the fives, and now that the credit, do you think that's going to be, I think, tough to analyze? Because if colleges aren't taking this data anymore and it's not for college credit, are kids going to do as well? Since an 11th grader tend to want to do as well because they want to report their scores when they apply to college, okay. this again is why seniors sometimes don't get. Yeah, <laughs> I think you know the I AP Latin your, teacher. Yeah. The AP Latin teacher said, "Does my exam have to be on prom day?" Yeah, <laughs> we said, "Okay, we'll look at that." You know, because you know seniors, I think, but for sure, sophomores and juniors want to do very well because it's going to factor into their college admissions process. Okay. Um, once seniors know in their second term. Our seniors just absolutely very well. Yeah, they I'm did. So they did. Well. They just did. Stay committed. Finish strong. Finish strong. Finish strong. OK. Yeah, I think I might be. So I'm going to invite Aaron Kind up to the podium, the director of counseling, to talk you through the last several si slides. <laughs> which have to do with college admissions. Thanks, Mara. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mara. Yeah, thank you, Mara. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, I just, I, um, it's nice to see you all. I, I guess I wanted to echo uh, maybe the board's comments and, and Mara's, like, this data is also quite good. Um, and um, what I am most concerned about, and I think Anne is as well, and other administrators, is that when the students get to college, they feel academically prepared and they're happy with where they're at. Um, I think it was just this week a few students came back to visit and they felt academically prepared and they were happy where they were where they were at, and I think that's that's most important. Um, at the same time. Um, there's a few slides ahead that you don't need to go to just yet, but um, the class of 2022 did very well, and I thought we were hitting some type of ceiling, and the class of 2023 proved uh, that that ceiling was made of glass, so these uh, results are even better than they were in the past. Um, just a little bit of background before I speak to the slide. Um, a parent emailed me last year and, and said early decision is king and uh, the class of 2023 kind of proved that early decision is when you can only apply to one school and if you get in that's the school you're going to uh, the class of 23 had 55 students that were accepted early decision um, just to give you some context I think there were a hundred 
what happens when you bring too many papers with you. There were 136. Uh, half the class, one early decision last 55 year. students. Yeah, uh, it was 40% of the class. 40%. Yeah. Um, there were 136 students in the class uh, that submitted applications in the class of 23. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Collectively, through early action, 84 students uh, ended up matriculating at a school that they applied to early. Um, the regular decision was kind of comparable to uh, from 23 to 22. Um, I think just the number of students that got in early brought that number down. Um, last year, the foundation helped the counseling department introduce some new software that helped the students sort of balance their list, which I would have liked to attribute some of the lower application numbers to. Um, and also the counseling department would like to take a little bit of credit just in providing better counsel and keeping students total application numbers, uh, you know, relatively manageable. Um, so the slide in front of you is the um, percent of the class of 2023 where they matriculated at based on the U.S. News and World Report rankings. Uh, the top 25 actually represents 25 the top 25 national colleges um, which are schools like all the ivy leagues hopkins northwestern vanderbilt notre dame and a few of the university of california schools and it also represents the top 25 liberal arts colleges um, some of those names are amherst bowdoin barnard wesleyan so that's essentially 50 of the best schools um, according to u.s news and world report um, the same is true for 26 through 50, the top 25, or the 26 through 50 liberal arts colleges, 26 through 50 national colleges. Um, a few of those names, just to give you some contents to context, excuse me. Holy Cross is 25 through 50 liberal arts college, Richmond, Bucknell, Lafayette. Uh, national colleges include a few more of the University of California schools, Stony Brook, University of Texas at Austin, and New York University. Um, and so on and so forth. I think you can go to the next one. This is just another um, ranking of colleges by selectivity. So instead of, you know, the U.S. News and World Report ranking them first to, I guess, you know, a thousand. Uh, this is by their uh, acceptance rate. This is from Barron's. Barron's publishes an annual list of colleges that maybe you've seen in my office or you might have on your bookshelf. Um, just to give you a sense, obviously the most competitive schools are the top schools that I mentioned before, accepting less than 25% of their students. Uh, the next biggest piece of the pie is the highly competitive schools, accepting roughly 26 to 35% of their students, American, Babson, Bates, uh, some schools in the NESCAC, uh, Case Western, Rochester, um, and then the acceptance rate, I guess you could say, increases as it goes from very competitive to competitive to other. The last slide, thank you. Uh, the last slide shows the historical context. Um, so you can see from 20, class of 2022, uh, these are percentages that you're looking at. So there was a smaller N in relation to the class of 2023. Um, so last year's students, just raw number, um, so was it 91 students were accepted at the most selective, most competitive schools, which are most selective, compared to the class of 2022, which was 86 students. Um, that next biggest uh, slice of the, of the bar graph there, um, that 18% represents tw approximately 25 students, um, and the 15% from the class of 2022 represents 18 students. So just, you know, they just keep doing better. It's, um, it's awesome. I'm so happy for those that, that graduated. Um, I'm also really excited about this year's class. Um, there's like so many innovators and leaders and critical thinkers and, and engaged citizens that um, I'm cautiously optimistic. Uh, I'm probably more than that, but I'm really excited to see how they do. Um, in addition to that, uh, thanks to your support, um, we were able to make some structural changes in the department. And this year we've been meeting with our students that much more, uh, the seniors that is, um, and Tim's actually been meeting with the ninth graders that much more and the fifth graders, um, but we're talking about seniors. Um, we also have the time 
uh, to run some workshops. Uh, so last year, uh, I'm sorry, last summer, the Supreme Court came out and made a ruling in this in this uh, case with Harvard and the University of North Carolina, and I, um, which necessitated some changes to the process. Uh, so as you all know, the biggest change was about you know uh, ethnicity or background. Um, and so in response to that, the colleges, most of the colleges our students apply to, definitely all the highly selective schools, uh, introduced uh, a writing prompt. Um, and this wasn't, you know, analyze these document-based questions, or this wasn't like a mini lit thing. Um, this was how have the environments or experiences of your upbringing, your family, home, neighborhood, community, shape the person you are today. That's what Tufts asked the students to respond to. Uh, Michigan asks, everyone belongs to many different communities and are groups defined by, among other things, shared geography, religion, ethnicity, income, cuisine, interest, race, ideology, or intellectual heritage. Choose one of these communities which you belong to and describe your place within it in 650 words. So this was going to be a challenge for everybody that's applying to college. Um, I contacted um, uh, an organization that like specializes in college essay writing. Um, and just last week, they zoomed in with interested seniors to help them draft this. Um, and we've been running some other workshops. I've been running them, and the other counselors have been running. This one, I kind of wanted a little bit more of an expert, if you will, uh, to help uh, guide our students. Um, and, you know, I'm really excited about this year's class. We're, we've been doing a lot of work. I've already been talking with Ann and the other counselors about, you know, ways we can even do better next year. Um, and, you know, the results are just phenomenal, again, to the teachers and the parents and the students. It's just like it's a community effort, and um, I couldn't be prouder. I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody has any. No questions on college admissions. <laughs> <laughs> I do have to say I'm a beneficiary of having a senior this year, and the amount of times that you're accessible to our seniors, even though you've taken on and added amount of students this year, given uh, one of the guidance counselors is out, is very appreciated by all of us, and we're very thankful, so thank you. For sure. Thank and you, Erin. And, and the workshops, I attended some of them there. They were excellent, so Erin did a great job in organizing them, getting the right people in to help our students. Yeah, Erin, I, I mean, I, I also have a, a high school senior, and I'd say the level of engagement from the department has been really impressive. And I remember this was one of the things when I joined the board, that many people in the community talk to us about, uh, about improving this part of the process, especially for seniors, so thank you. Yeah, and I, um, I, I appreciate it very much, and I, um, you know, um, I'm open to feedback and constructive criticism to anybody watching or anybody on the board. Um, I'm always looking for ideas and always trying to get better. Um, I, I will share this, that uh, I spoke to a parent earlier this week, and she was comparing notes with uh, a friend of hers who has a child at a private school in the city, um, and she she felt like we were doing on par with them. My goal is to really like have one of all of you either watching or in, in the audience to like really kind of pound your chest about what we're doing here because I want to be better. Um, I want to be better. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you, much. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mara and uh, Aaron. It's always um, one of my favorite presentations because you really get a sense of, although it's only one data point, certainly the New York State tests and the, the regents exams, the APs, the college admissions, but it's a, it's a beautiful trajectory uh, to watch all the way through as our, our students make their way from kindergarten uh, through graduation. So thank you. Um, personnel. Uh, the board has had an opportunity uh, to review these items. We have before you um, a minor revision to middle school advisors due to a parent leave. We have a few um, expected overages. Uh, we have uh, two leave replacements uh, in elementary for uh, parent leaves. 
a new teacher aid, which has been budgeted for, as well as a new elementary library clerk and a new uh, senior office assistant in our elementary school, both due to um, resignations. And then we have um, the beginning of some new uh, coaches for our winter season and before you the initial winter coaching roster. So I ask you to consider this evening items A through T. Could we have a motion please to approve items A through T on the personnel? Motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. All right, good. Thank you. And um, we move to Dan. The board has received the September financial summary. Um, and the expenditure results were on target with no anomalies other than uh, private school transportation, which we've discussed. Um, um, at the end of the month, we saw a rain event that caused a sewage backup. And although we have not seen all the invoices yet, we don't anticipate needing any kind of emergency appropriation, uh, but can handle the cleaning expenses through the maintenance budget. Uh, we're coping with ri these rising transportation costs, and the uh, full board is considering an analysis of ways to contain these costs. Um, no immediate changes are anticipated at this time, but we're looking for long-term solutions and for what is a, really a rise, rising well above inflation part of our budget. Uh, and we're also starting to see some clarity regarding revenues. And revenues last year and this year are going to be good news. Um, Non-resident tuition and projected interest income look to um, exceed their budgets substantially and should go a long way in establishing uh, the base of a surplus for the current year. So at this early date, I'm usually predicting not much, but I'm predicting at least half a million uh, going going forward um, into next year, which is great when we start the budget because, uh, you know, we always, our starting point is planning to use about a half a million dollars to offset the tax levy. You know, that's been consistent over the last 10 years or so. And uh, we would certainly have the ability to do that this year. Um, there's a, a slew of financial action items today. Yeah. Uh, items A through F, well, we see these item, most of these items every year around this time, um, and they serve to authorize us to do business via agreements with a series of vendors. Items A through F involve contracted services for either special education services or uh, nursing services for field trips and substitutes. These services supplement our programs by either providing these special education uh, or nursing services that we can't or choose not to provide on our own because it would be too expensive to employ uh, uh, people to do this. Um, I believe we've worked with all of these vendors in the past and we seek to use them again as needed uh, for this year as well. Um, so I guess, Connie, can we go A through F? Were there any questions on um, any of the contracts that Dan has described? And if there are none, could we have a motion to approve items A through F? Motion, motion to approve. Second. All Second. in favor? Aye. Aye. All in favor? Aye. 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 Item G is a foundation grant uh, to send two faculty members to the National Council for Social Studies Conference through the L. Gordon Harris History Designated Fund of the Foundation. And, you know, I'm a broken record when I get up here and say, you know, much thanks to the foundation. There's very few, uh, certainly uh, in the area, that have as much support as we have through our foundation. And I would add, it's just a great partnership that we have um, with the foundation and the district and the community. And um, uh, I'm not sure actually the whole board's aware of this, but the leadership team pulled together um, a contribution to the foundation, personal contribution collectively. So um, just another example of the, the great partnership. We're very grateful for that. 
And then finally, item H um, is extending our food service agreement, which was competitively bid in 2021 for another year. We can do so for five years. And the goal of the service is to break even while providing the best uh, service and food that we can at reasonable prices. Um, it's a self-sustaining fund, and uh, we think Chartwells is doing a good job, so we want to keep them again for another year. And so we um, we only get one bid for our food service. Last time out, we only got one bid. Okay. And it's uh, you know we're small potatoes in the food service business. <laughs> Yeah. No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> and and our contract with them is a management fee, and then we guarantee they won't have an operate. So we guarantee yeah. to cover any operating yes. loss. Have we had to cover any losses in recent only years? During, only COVID-related. COVID, related, okay. Because they were anomalous. Okay. And they, they, you know, we were open when nobody else was, and they did a tremendous job, you know, serving our kids in that environment so uh, you know the chartwells has been a great partner for you know probably the last 14 years here yeah so uh items g and h i think we need approval um we can do those together sure okay if there's no further questions motion from pete yeah second second from eddie all in favor all right. Aye. Aye. Moving to facilities. There's a lot going on. Uh, tomorrow is three weeks, weeks removed from our last rain incident. Um, the, the small sewage backup cleanup that we had is completed. Um, it was completed a week ago. Actually, it was really completed by that Monday after the Friday event. We could have been down there. But, uh, you know, we do things the right way. We have an industrial hygienist come in here and do testing and make sure that, uh, that nothing uh, shows up um, beyond accepted levels. And they do air testing and surface testing. And, uh, and we were fine on the first go around. Uh, thanks to Mike Lee and his staff. Uh, we think we have the solution to future issues down there. Uh, it seems that the sump pump under the Innovation Center, which is where the old boiler room was, that thing runs 24-7. It, it, when we were doing construction down there, we tore it up, and there's literally a river running under the school building. So that thing is just running continuously. And it's routed to discharge into our sanitary lines. Uh, to make a long story short, we think that the sanitary water that came back into the building after we closed the, both the backflow valves was actually groundwater from that sump pump that we were pumping back into the system ourselves. Um, uh, so we were actually, you know, kind of pumping, uh, pumping ourselves into trouble there. So now we have a way of diverting that water when we have a rain incident instead of going into our sanitary lines there's an out feed on the pond field side road of the building that we can that we can divert that to and not that i'm looking forward to another rain event but uh <laughs> we'll that's the it. way yeah. that's the only way we're going to test whether that is 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 the solution so um if that is the case and it, and it works we'll then add that to our um our rain event checklist along with uh you know doing those backflow valves and, and dan it might be worth mentioning here um given how extreme that last rain event was how little damage relative to that extreme rain we sustained we and had no no outside uh, water in the building those pumps worked yeah and i think it's good for the community to hear that and they ran <laughs> and they ran and we've had experts tell us that we would have been, um, I've heard estimates as high as five feet underwater in oh, parts yeah. of the school. Oh. Um, so those pumps did a great job. And um, we, and, and I know we don't have the final numbers, um, but if you were to guess, we're talking. Uh, it probably, I don't know, maybe $50,000 in bringing a cleanup crew in here. Right. Something like that. Whereas um, if we had gotten water in the building, once we lose a gym, 
when it gets to that level, we're talking about a million, a little over a million. Right. Between all the cleanup and what it takes to replace gym floors. I've heard a lot of questions from the community about that, so I wanted that to be um, no. No, those, those pumps worked as designed, and they, they really saved us. And it was dicey there for a while. But um, we got through it. Um, what else? We expect the energy study to be completed by the end of the month. I checked in with them to see how they were doing. They're working on some comments from NYSERDA and uh, hope to get a, uh, a draft to us by the end of the month. And um, I've been planning with, uh, with Eddie, who's the chair of the facilities committee, to meet uh, in November prior to the next board meeting and after the preliminary audit draft is in hand. Um, so we know exactly where we are with the construction reserve fund to put forth a recommendation on uh, the pump enclosure. And I was asked um, by, the, uh, by the board earlier that if we can kind of put, put a rendering up there of what that enclosure would look like, and I'll have that up at the next Great. board meeting Thank you. for everybody to see. Um, let's see. And um, when we receive the energy study, we're, um, you know, that's going to help in prioritizing the five year plan recommendations uh, to begin shaping our next capital project. Um, I, th we're, I think we're planning on putting a small one on the ballot this spring using our capital reserve to include the pump enclosure. And we're also looking at a security vestibule uh, by the main entrance. We're trying to get some, uh, some hard numbers on what that would take. Because we have, you know, what they call man traps, both on the Meadow Avenue side and in the elementary side, but not at the pond field entrance. So we're looking to redesign that. And we can't really build anything on the outside because, you know, the uh, historical preservation people don't want us to change the facade of the front of the building, so it has to be done inside. Um, but we're, we want to do that, and, and also, depending uh, how the first outdoor classroom goes, maybe a little more funding for another one. We'll see. Um, but uh, that's what we're looking forward to. I think, uh, I think over the next three or four years, you'll see a, a little project, which we'll use our own money for, and then maybe a year, year or two down the road, a much larger project taking care of all the infrastructure of a 100-year-old building. And uh, that will be a combination of using capital reserve money and uh, a bond issue, which would serve to supplant debt service that's going off the books so it won't really be um, a large impact on the uh, tax levy. Right. Well, that's also where the surplus is a little bit of a misnomer because we're planning to try and build up that capital reserve mm -hmm. using surplus um, to reduce the amount of a bond offering. Yep. Well, let's see. And uh, we're also looking at making our doors safer. Um, I, you know, should put one of those jars out there with marbles in it, say, guess how many doors we have? <laughs> and if anybody's looking, the answer is 833 wow. doors leading to occupied space <laughs> in the building. And uh, if we're looking to fortify doors to make them resistant to uh, any kind of intrusion, uh, you know, there'll be a, probably a door prioritization <laughs> analysis to go along with that because doing it all at once, uh, you know, that's a capital project by itself. But we are starting to look at that. Uh, and I have no facilities action items tonight. Great. Thank you for all those updates, Dan. No problem. Do we have any? There's, we, we have, have one other action item. We are looking to oh, dispose of an outdated forensic textbook from 15 years ago, <laughs> 45 copies, and first we seek to donate, and if there's no takers, we probably could have used them on the bonfire, but that would have created a viral video that <laughs> oh might have gosh. been misinterpreted. So we're just going to sneak them into a dumpster in the middle of the night. 
Ja. <laughs> All right, may we have a motion to um, decommission the, the uh, forensic science uh, textbook and dispose of them accordingly? Motion. <laughs> Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Would have been a bad look. <laughs> Would have been. Uh, We've had a few committee meetings since the last regular meeting. Um, it'd be great to have some brief updates. Um, Sarah, I don't know if you had anything from the PTA council meetings or? No, the only thing I'd like to highlight with the PTA, and there are so many people to thank for all that they do to enhance the, um, our kids' experience here. There's, there's one continuing theme. We have so much social emotional learning going on in all three of our schools and mental health is such a hot topic that I love to hear in these PTA meetings more. Every, the additional programming that's being done. Um, Be Well has um, Jennifer Wallace coming in November speaking about it's never enough and this toxic culture and kids really need to know that they matter and that they're valued and it's not dependent on all their achievements. and. We just had um, Speak Sobriety come in during homecoming to address this topic with ninth graders and drinkings and the pressures and they came at night to speak to the adults and Bold tomorrow um, led by Christine Dowd, Aaron and Anna are going to be there and our psychologists are going to be there and so a chance for parents to come meet and what more that they can do to, to help their children and again I can't help but not mention the foundation, they're piloting a program, they're funding a program with um, Mental Health First Aid, is that correct? And faculty and students are um, gonna be trained if their peers are suffering, how to help them, where to go. Um, so all of these programmings are just, and actually even our athletic department had a mental performance coach come in and speak to our teams about the anxieties of performing on a field, on a court. And all these things are just to help our children and I as a parent and a board member, I'm just grateful to the PTA, the foundation, and our administration for all they're doing to help our kids on a daily basis. So I just wanted to stress that that is just a theme in every single one of our yeah. PTA meetings. So thanks so much, Sarah. Yep. Did you have anything from professional? Um, no, I have something with safety, safety. and curriculum. Okay. But, um, uh, as far as I mean, I'll start with the curriculum. I mean, there was no determinations made, but I think we had a lively discourse. Uh, on civil discourse and the integration of that topic into the curriculum is you know as you know uh, as most of you know last year we updated the policy for the board in civil discourse uh, that was a project unto itself uh, and now the the leadership team is taking that upon themselves to find a way to integrate that into the curriculum so I know Mars worked very hard on that and we've had a lot of discussions and I would expect that to continue uh, Second thing was just on the safety committee, um, which generally is a pretty calm committee, but I think that this time, and I want to pass it, maybe Rachel or Dan want to comment on this, that on the September 29th uh, rain event, uh, there was a lot of discussion about the evacuation of the school um, with the students and what we learned and maybe how we might consider uh, doing it going forward should we face another event like that. Yeah, I'm happy to elaborate. So uh, for those parents that experienced it, they'll know exactly uh, what we're sure. referring to. Um, so generally speaking, our 6th through 12th graders with an emergency dismissal are independent, where they can leave the building on their own and make their way home. Um, it was torrential rains. There was, we were surrounded by flooding. Um, so that was not a typical emergency exit for even our 6th through 12th graders. Um, and then our emergency dismissal for the elementary school, let's just say it was organized chaos. Um, and we have uh, conducted an after action review and Rakia and Anthony were all over it and have since created um, an emergency dismissal uh, process that will be much more systematic even when we have two out of our three exits shut down which is what happened um, on the 29th. Um, Vic Prini, who's our director of security, was in touch with the village police, um, and they were in a tough spot too, right, because there was flooding all over the village. And because our exit was only Pondfield, because our exits on Meadow and Midland um, 
were uh, shut down because of flooding, you know, we added to the village um, difficulties that were happening because we were all coming out on Pond Field. And at that time, the police were trying to um, handle that volume. Um, so we uh, certainly will continue our strong partnership with the village police. Um, we did feel it was important to have that emergency dismissal given that we were taking on sanitation on our ground floor. Um, so uh, Dan's already elabor elaborated upon the uh, facilities aspect of that. And uh, we feel very good about the process we have in place um, for elementary as it relates to emergency dismissals. And we are scheduled to put that to the test that Wednesday before Thanksgiving, uh, where we will run a full emergency dismissal with the elementary school, where the parents will have to come in and go to designated areas um, to sign their child out. Excellent, thank mm -hmm. you. So. Okay. Um, Mickey, did you have anything to add on the foundation? We, we did. We had a foundation meeting, um, Dr. Kelly and I intended, and, and I think the, the theme here is just we are so grateful for all the work the foundation does on our behalf. They, they raise money, they're thoughtful, they think about programming, they review grants. Um, the night we were there, they were stuffing envelopes to begin their annual um, uh, uh, community, yeah, community drive, which, which begins at the end of this month. Um, and last year's community drive was actually a 5% increase in terms of actual funding, uh, and we're hoping for a little bit more this time. Um, it is, you know, one clear example of the work that the foundation does, we'll all start to see very soon. Um, the outdoor classroom um, is either being starting They'll now. They'll mobilize probably, they were supposed to go this week, but probably go next week. And should be done in December. Um, and we're all going to have that very soon. Um, just one clear example of the work the foundation does. So very thankful and grateful for, for everything they do. Um, I feel lucky um, to be the, uh, the board's liaison to the foundation. Thanks so much, Mickey. And Pete. Policy committee. <clears throat> so the policy committee has not been in place since 2003, 2004, and I'm starting to figure out why. <laughs> um, but you know, we had our first meeting yesterday, and actually, Dr. Kelly's got a great roadmap. Um, first, um, you know, the state requires certain new policies, so take, let's get the new policies we have. We'll reword it in our own language. Uh, second, we're going to, uh, there's an update to required policies, so we're going to rewrite those. Third, there are new policies that, that the board and the administration wants, we're going to work on those. And lastly, let's clean up and declutter all these policies we've just, just keep in our policies over the past 50 years. You know, they're just not pertinent anymore, they're just excess, so it's going to be a process over the next six months. But, you know, first and foremost, ones that are required by the state, we'll take care of those. And I want to thank Connie very much. She is, you know, as with other things that with all these board meetings, she really provides us with all the information, tells us what we have to have uh, from the state, and it's just a, a great resource. So thank you, Connie. Connie's the brains behind the operation. <laughs> thank you, Pete. Um, we're at the part of our meeting. Um, uh, where we um, are eager to hear public comment. Just a reminder, if you'd please um, state your name before you speak. Um, and um, as I said, we're eager for any comments you wish to share with us. Um, we uh, have in the past answered questions to clarify a quick fact, um, but it's not intended to be a question and answer um, session only because, um, you know, the questions are rarely uh, easy to answer. Um, if, we, if we don't provide a uh, reaction, you shouldn't expect a, a response to your comment. It's not because we don't hear you. It's simply because um, we want to hear you and we will certainly consider uh, anything you have to share. So with that, um, is there anyone who'd like to offer a comment? I'll go uh, I'm 
Aaron Gold. I am a proud citizen of the Bronxville community. And, uh, and I'd like to read a couple excerpts from a letter that my wife wrote. She is unequivocally the most eloquent and intelligent, articulate of the Gold family. So I'm going to read what she wrote as opposed to what I would have written. Uh, and this is in response to uh, Dr. Kelly's very thoughtful address uh, regarding events in the Middle East. Uh, but this, this letter was actually written prior to an incident that has come up recently. But I think it's still pertinent, so I thought we'd just read it for you here. Uh, my name is Aaron Gold, but I'm going to read it as if it's Alexis Gold. Um, it says, Hi, Dr. Kelly. My name is Alexis Gold. We have three children in the Bronxville School District. I wanted to take a moment to reach out with respect to your emails earlier this week. We appreciate your taking the time to address the very sad and mounting situation in the Middle East. As a Jewish family in Bronxville, we were proud to co-host the Rosh Hashanah event in the school cafeteria, supported by the PTA DEI committee last year. We were delighted to see how many people came to learn and understand the high holidays. Even more so to find out that there is a growing, albeit small, Jewish community in this one square mile. We were thrilled to expose a large part of the seventh grade class to our small world last year by hosting the only bat mitzvah in the seventh grade class. We had enormous support from friends and family who truly enjoyed the service and the celebration. Many of them said to me, after the warmth and strength of the ceremony, that made me wish I was Jewish. Still, we note that lacrosse camps are scheduled on Rosh Hashanah. Our club informs us and its members that the club is open for the day off, which was Yom Kippur. PTA socials are occasionally scheduled during the high holidays. And the speakers blast Kanye West during the homecoming food truck uh, when it occurred, despite last year's controversy with the basketball team. Growing up in a Long Island town called Massapequa, which was fondly nicknamed Matza Pizza by its <laughs> residents, graduating from Cornell, working on a trading floor for two decades while living on the Upper West Side, the world felt Jewish to me. People often ask why we moved to Bronxville, which is not known for its burgeoning Jewish community. We moved here because we knew the world was progressive and educated enough not to ask us questions like that. We love the community and the school. We moved to Bronxville well aware that we would be even more in the minority than any national average would indicate. But we knew our children would grow up in a warm village with people that supported one another and their cultural differences. My kids are not growing up in a world like mine where they feel like everyone is Jewish. When they go to Hebrew school on Thursday instead of CCD on Wednesday, they know they are different. But we have been lucky. Our children have embraced their differences. Our eighth grader was able to celebrate one of her greatest accomplishments, becoming a bat mitzvah with so many friends from Bronxville. Our fifth grade daughter loves teaching her class how to play dreidel and being the kid that gets to bring in M&Ms. And our son has showed up with homemade latkes for Passover that the teacher stood in line for. They are proud of who they are, and again, we are very lucky. But now I'm nervous. We feel the undercurrent of negativity in the world, and it makes me shiver. It made me really want to understand the Kanye West controversy with the basketball team, and while I do appreciate that they apologized, the fact that no one sat out a game seemed shocking. My daughter gets detention if she is late for middle school chorus. No one has said anything to my children yet, but I am bracing myself for it. This note wasn't meant to put any pressure or onus on you or the school or ask anyone for anything. I just wanted to remind people in the district that there are Jewish families in town, even if we are few and far between. I wanted to provide some thoughts and insight about what it feels like for us to live here. I can't speak for anyone else. Thank you again, Dr. Kelly, for your words this week. Um, and we would offer to be as helpful as we can in helping increase people's awareness of the community here. Uh, we have friends in the community that would be pleased to speak, many ideas we could talk to you about, so we'll offer any help we can provide. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
just over to uh, Dr. Kelly. My son was on the modified soccer team missing the game, so um, I could not believe what he told me and Dr. Bader took a stance and quit the team. Um, I would like to know if the school and the board will address this with the community because a lot of rumors are going around. People are making up stories. Um, unfortunately, I got a call from the teacher who saw the accident and reported it. He was almost in tears saying he's been targeted by our own community members. Um, I'm just curious as educators um, and board members in charge of our school, are you going to address this behavior, which is very unacceptable. Um, and my only other question is, are you going to put out a statement about this and let the community know what actually happened? Because um, right now, some of us who email Dr. Kelly are the one in possession of information, but everybody pays taxes here and everybody wants their kids to be part of the Brownsville Promise and everybody has a right to know what's going on. Um, the other question is, as part of educating and DEI Promise and Brownsville Promise, um, is there any thought given to how do we expose our kids to global critical thinking and to things like Holocaust, the things what happened in history that actually very much shapes every family in this town. So um, we're not a Jewish family, but I think this impacts every single one of us. So I would love to get a response from the board and the school at some point. And I really would love to see teachers and coaches not being harassed in this community. I think we're better than this. So you have the power and the voice, so hopefully you'll use it in the right way. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. <coughs> I'd just like to make a, a quick statement that when um, inappropriate behavior comes to our attention, whether it's racist, anti-Semitic, uh, just disrespectful, um, we address it immediately. And this is a situation that came to our attention and under the leadership of Joe McClora, our middle school principal, it was addressed uh, swiftly, uh, severely, and um, we, I also want people to remember that uh, we're dealing with children, and children are gonna make mistakes, and uh, there were some real mistakes made last Wednesday. Um, and you have to suffer the consequences when you make mistakes, and then you have to learn from them. Um, and we do need to be careful. We're a very small community, um, and we do want to respect people's privacy because kids are going to make mistakes. And I don't necessarily, we don't want that to follow them for the rest of their career here in Bronxville. So um, please rest assured, again, when incidents are brought to our attention, we absolutely do not shy away from addressing them. Um, and we're also reviewing, um, you know, what we can do and strengthen here within the school uh, with the six, six and a half hours of when we have your children. If there are no further comments, um, may I please have a motion to adjourn the meeting? Motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you.